Okay. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Can you hear me? All right. So this one's going to go really fast. Um, I'm going to go ahead and lay out the burden. Um, I think to win, my opponent must prove that the exist that exiting the Iran deal is worth the economic cost at home and abroad, somehow making the world safer. I will prove that exiting the Iran deal is showing a strong potential for a negative economic impact, if not bringing us closer to unnecessary war. And I don't want to talk about what the deal is too much because I, but I, I uh, but I'm going to go ahead and say what it is. And in a nutshell, it's an international agreement bound through UN Resolution 2231 between the U.S., France, Russia, Germany, China, and Britain. The G. CPOA itself outlines the U.S. commitment, the result of which has been uh, <clears throat> IAEA successfully inspecting ten, uh, the Iranian facility 10 times and Iran destroying 97% of its stockpile. It would take a year for them to build a weapon under this agreement, and no party involved, including the former CIA, CIA director, <laughs> Mike Pompeo, believe, believes that the uh, agreement has been breached. So what's the problem here? Exiting the Iran deal has already raised gas prices domestically to reduce supply and put the EU in economic crisis because of the trade because of trade agreements with Iran, as explained in uh, my links to the Wall Street Journal and routers. It makes the U.S. less credible on the international stage with both our Middle Eastern allies and European partners. It may also potentially escalate the proxy situation in Syria. So to ensure economic stability and peace, I ask you vote pro for the resolution. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my opponent before I elaborate. OK, um, I guess the, I don't necessarily agree with your terms is what define what is a reason for staying in or leaving. To me, it was a bad agreement from the get-go, uh, a treaty. It was not an agreement uh, between the United States uh, in accordance with this handy-dandy little thing called the United States Constitution. And as such, since a new executive takes power and takes a look and says, you know, this is a really crappy agreement. Nowhere in the agreement is Iran required to suspend their terrorist supports. They're no longer they're not required to stop uh, efforts to develop ICBMs. They're not uh, required to do anything except agree to some face saving measures on limiting their production of enriched uranium. However, a lot of their facilities where they could do enrichment are military facilities, and the accord gives Iran the right to self-inspect and self-report. There's no provisions for SNAP inspections. In short, it's a bogus treaty that was agreed to by the former president of the United States, and as such, it has no binding action on the United States. I would remind people, for example, here's what Ted Kennedy, I mean, uh, here's what uh, Ted, Theodore Roosevelt said about an, an, an article, to, an, a, a treaty that he was getting into with Santa Domingo. He said, the Constitution did not forbid my doing what I did. I put the agreement into effect and I continued its execution for two years before the Senate acted, but I would have continued it until the end of my term, if necessary, without any action by Congress. Well, it turns out Congress never ratified it, okay? It was far preferable that there should be action by Congress so that we might be proceeding under a treaty, which was a law of the land and not merely by direction of the chief executive, which would lapse when that particular executive left office. Well, guess what? Iran steamrolled Obama. Obama was gutless and unwilling to put these provisions forward for the Senate to ratify. And therefore, it was an executive agreement that the United States could withdraw when a new chief executive took a look and said, oh, by the way, this was a crappy deal. We're withdrawing. And the recent revelation by uh, Israel, where they managed to, through a little bit of espionage, 
download uh, and copy over a thousand pounds of secret documents that Iran was not supposed to have, or if they had them, they were supposed to turn them over. They claimed that their enrichment program was only for nuclear power, power plants, where the enrichment Okay, um, let's go ahead and rebut real quick to your points. I, I think if they destroyed 97% of their stockpile, that's better than no agreement at all, no matter how you look at this. And I think what you're pointing to is uh, Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister's statements the week before Trump uh, announced that the U.S. would lead the deal. The thing is that he's talking about 2003. He's not talking about 2018. So he's going back to 2003. So it, and if I mean, if they had violated the deal, why didn't he say how they violated the deal? He had to go back to 2003. And, if, and it's not a secret that they were doing that. They were that this was going on in 2003, that they may have been trying to create a weapon in 2003. The thing is that they don't need one now. They don't have a motive because they the only because they need the only reason they would need a weapon is a rock. And we already took out a rock. And the reason that they would need a weapon for a rock is that is that we gave Iraq chemical weapons in the 80s. So to and we were backing Iraq in that war. So they had a they had a motive to create a weapon before, but they don't have a motive now. So so 2000 we're not talking about 2018, we're talking about 2003. Um, so, so let's go ahead and move on to the economic the economic. So China receives 30% of its oil from Iran. The EU have partners that have several contracts with Iran through uh, Airbus um, and, but, and by so and when we reinstate these sanctions within 180 days, it puts the U.S. in a position where it has to punish the companies that do business with Iran, as uh, Bolton is saying. So, uh, so we uh, we have to enforce this, and it could it could also have a negative impact on the U.S. because they could go to the World Trade Organization, and it could look a lot like when we try to sanction Cuba, and that failed. So, so. Uh, so there isn't a good. So this is going to harm the U.S. economically. It's going to harm our partners in Europe economically, who are already hurting, and and also we have this agreement with them. Uh, so it makes us look bad because we're not upholding our end of the agreement because it's it is an agreement. I mean, it, it's an agreement that was signed by the United States, Iran, and our European partners. Yeah, the, it, through the UN resolution, uh, this this is uh, in in my references. I, I think what you're referring to is the you're shaking your head because of the partisan Congress didn't sign it. The, you're not. You're not. The thing is that it's the it's through a UN resolution. It's not the agreement isn't through the U.S. It isn't an agreement between the U.S. and Iran. It's an agreement between the P5 plus one and Iran. So 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 that you're using a you're that's not a good argument. <laughs> uh, and so then we have to look at. So, so, so what's going to happen? The, they're going to they're going to. OK, a uh, couple of things. First of all, there was no U.S. agreement. The executive can sign a temporary agreement that serve that will not survive his leaving office uh, it, to, to bind the United States requires a treaty. A treaty binds the United States. There was no treaty. OK, and Obama did everything possible to work at, with a few of his allies in Congress to keep uh, Congress from really acting on it because Obama knew that there was no way that two thirds of the Senate would ratify it in the same way that the Paris Accords for climate change were never ratified because the vast majority of people would be opposed to it. OK, you keep talking about economics. I would point to you that in 1941, Japan uh, attacked the United States because we decided we did not want to deal with them economically. It cost us some in terms of trade, but we decided that Japan was a dangerous a comp country that was oppressing uh, Korea, Manchuria. It was uh, militaristically invading other countries, and we would no longer sell them steel, scrap steel, or oil, okay? Because we were not going to legitimize a, an evil regime. Well, Iran, the Iran mullahs, the Iran go government is an evil regime that oppresses its own people, 
it shouts death to America, death to Israel. It has every desire to develop nuclear weapons. You say that the, that treasure trove was 2003. That's bullshit. If that treasure trove was 2003, by the tre- terms of the agreement, they were supposed to turn over all documents. They claimed that they did not have a nuclear weapons program. Those documents proved it was a lie. The fact that they did not turn over that treasure trove, admit to its existence and rel- uh, relinquish it, is proof that they violated the treaty. And that was a violation discovered in 2018, not 2003. Okay, you can trade and say, I want economic benefits, but that's close to what uh, Lenin said about how we'll hang the last capitalist with the uh, rope that uh, he sells us. Okay, sometimes you have to realize that an evil regime you cannot deal with for, quote, economic benefits. And when they're working behind doors uh, that we can't inspect because they have declared off limits any of their military sites. There's no snap inspections. It is a toothless agreement. And yes, there may be some economic benefits short term. And by the way, the 97% of enrichment, the highly enriched uranium. What I got, what I was trying to say when I got cut off there was that they're just going to renegotiate this without us. Uh, That's what I was trying to get at. So, So let me, let me, let me get into my second rebuttal here. The both the Mossad and the CIA do not believe that Iran is trying to acquire a nuclear weapon now. They agree with my statement that I said earlier, and you can find this in my links. Uh, what if it, I, the, the article is what if Iran had never had never so, something a nuclear weapon anyway? So they both they both believe that, like I said, that because because Iraq was defeated in 2003, Iran has no reason to create a nuclear weapon. Uh, then I, I think if you're ta- if, if China is buying 30% of its oil from Iran, there's going to be more than a short-term impact uh, because of supply and demand. And then, of course, you have to look at the way that the sanctions would be enforced and how that would affect the economy in, in the long term as well. Um, because I mean, the, the EU feels like it's important enough that they would have to renegotiate, renegotiate it without us. And so... We, so and then let me get to my second. So let me, I'm going to put the economic thing aside and let me get to my second second argument here, which is how that it, the probability of it bringing us closer to war. And I think the thing with Israel is that they're actually more threatened by the situation and the proxy situ, situation in Syria than by Iran, because Iran has no way to, first of all, they have no way to send a nuclear weapon toward to Israel. There's no way for them to do that. Um, it's, uh, but the thing is that that's, that's a proxy situation where uh, the U.S. Is, is backing one side and Iran is backing the other side. There's been direct confrontations between Iran and Syria recently. It's going on for the past, for well, for a long time, but it's really heated up in the past few months, even especially since the deal was, the deal was nixed. So there's, there's a greater possibility that the situation in Syria, because they could they could fire on Israel or that sort of thing. So the the odds of that happening are a lot greater than the odds of um, of Iran directly attacking Israel. Uh, that proxy situation is going to heat up. So this this agitates that that situation. Uh, the guy, I think this could because this could probably turn into a who's funding who. Um, the the thing is that Hezbollah is actually fighting ISIS, and ISIS is a com- completely somehow completely around the Israeli border. I don't know, that could touch on another subject, but yeah, Hezbollah is actually fighting ISIS. So I, I think that, so that, that, I don't know. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just turn it over to my, my opponent. Okay, again, I would just restate, it's a bad agreement from the get-go. It did not require Iran to substantially modify its terrorist tactics and it allowed them to continue to develop ballistic missile technology, which they continued to do. And they have got some significant gains that have been made uh, over the past years. Okay, you say that, okay, Iraq is uh, no longer a threat, but that's irrelevant. They have expansionist desires. And one of the things uh, the discussion is, is that if 
Iran is able to get somehow a nuclear weapon, that Shia country can exert a undue pressure on the many surrounding countries that are Sunni. And the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to have uh, Saudi Arabia and Egypt decide that they too will need to balance Iran out by also trying to attempt to acquire nuclear weapons through whatever means possible. You want to see a nuclear arms race? Let Iran go unabated. You want to know who the one of the biggest proponents of Trump ending the uh, this agreement, this toothless agreement that was worthless, the Iranian people. The Iranian people have been oppressed by an evil regime that controls them. And the, the, the Twitter field and the underground internet, there were people that were rejoicing. They would like to have economic sanctions brought back. They would like to see pressure put, put on the regime. They would like to see it collapse. In 2009, Obama missed a chance. He bungled like everything else he ever did in the presidency. He bungled a chance when there was a green revolution and a potential that if he had put the right amount of pressure, he could have helped topple that regime. But Obama sucked up and did everything possible to aid and assist the regime. His agreement legitimizes the reg th this regime. He, he basically is putting them on life support so that they don't collapse. And the billions that they got, they've been using, putting into supporting terrorists all over the regime. The agreement was crappy. And just the very example that Obama was willing to stop the DEA from enforcing and arresting Hezbollah actors involved in drug running is proof of his complicity and how bad the deal was. So, OK, so we're getting into some points that are beside the point because they don't really talk about nuclear weapons. So I'll, I'll just go through them all real quick. First, we have ballistic missiles. Trump has put separate sanctions on Iran because of their ballistic missiles, which cannot carry a nuclear warhead anyway. Some people that some people say there's potential for them to carry a nuclear warhead, but they can't. We're talking of their the Shabab missiles that are a rendition of the old Scud missiles. They can't carry nuclear warheads. Some some people are trying to argue that they potentially could, but we haven't seen evidence that they could. No, because that would be a violation of the agreement, and no one, no one, even even Trump's former advisor says that they're not violating the agreement. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, and I, I think when you say Saudi and Egypt, could they acquire nuclear weapons? Does anyone in the Middle East already have nuclear weapons? That's my question for you. And uh, as far as your Iranian people support Trump. And no, it's not all the Iranian people. It's just, could, could you, would, there's some, some, uh, far, there, it's the far right in Iran that they would, they want to go to war. Surprise, surprise. So you're talking about, you're just talking about the far right. And I have an article from the Jerusalem Post that talks about that, that I, uh, that I posted up there. And uh, when you talk about Obama, that this is a, because it becomes partisan politics, it becomes Obama. The thing is that Obama, he's, he's a senator, he started the sanctions. So you're at you think that this is all Obama. You're actually arguing for Obama's policy that he started. <laughs> so it doesn't really have anything to do with Obama. It's especially it's 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 it's, uh, it's international diplomacy. And, the, and and as I keep saying, if we back out, what's going to happen? Then they're just going to they're going to renegotiate this deal without us. And we won't have us. We won't have a say. Uh, so let, let's go ahead and look at the long term impact here. Uh, Rohini says that they will that they will continue to negotiate without the United States as a member. Uh, China and France have already met without us. They've already met with Iran without us. Uh, and the EU says that it's a crisis. So, uh, so I think moving forward, that uh, if not for the economics, say that you're worried that you're worried about this in spite of the fact that everyone says that they're upholding the agreement and that no one can prove they're not upholding the agreement. Now you don't have a say. So you just, you just bargain yourself out of it. Don't where the only thing you can do is, is try to, is try to put more sanctions to, to stop the, to stop these countries from trying to help their economy for dealing with Iran. So now the United States has to enforce that. And that hurts United, the, our, our companies here because they sell to these foreign companies. 
So it's it's just putting us in a bad position where the, where it can only escalate for the worst. Well, I disagree with you. Uh, there's not a, a, a zero sum game. Uh, oil prices go up, and in the United States and other places. Uh, exploration will increase, fracking will increase. Uh, we can offset uh, the loss of Iranian oil through uh, other means. Uh, yes, the five European countries that are signatory can uh, come up with their own ar agreements, but we can take a look and say, we're gonna have sanctions against Iran and any countries or companies that do business with Iran. We basically can take a uh, position that says, Iran is a bad actor, they're a terrorist state, they are supporting terrorism, they're doing all these evil things, and until they are willing to prove that they're gonna stop doing it, you know, we're gonna keep these sanctions on, and we will have sanctions on any country or company that does the same. That's a that's a solid position. And if that was Obama's position as a senator, fine, let's let's stick with it. But that having sanctions on an evil empire, an evil regime is far better. And it's far it's to say that the people that are opposed to Iran are, quote, right wingers who want want war. That's complete and total idiocy. Take a look at Iran 1978, 1979, before the fall of the Shah. Women had rights. They didn't have to go around wearing bags over their bodies. Okay, there was a lot more freedom. Those people would like a return to freedom, whereas you sound like you'd be more than willing for the benefit of your own wallet to continue to prop up an evil regime that oppresses 70 million people just so you can have a little bit cheaper gas and just so a European uh, company might not be able to undercut an American company. At some point, we have to do like what we did to Japan in 1940. We cut off their oil, we cut off their steel, and said, we're not going to support a re an evil regime. Yeah, it turned out that they, re they, they retaliated by, by starting a war, attacking us at Pearl Harbor. They hoped that they could attack us and get us to agree to renegotiate those treaties and continue to start supplying them. But at some point, you have to do the right thing. And supporting an evil regime that oppresses its own people horribly while spreading terror throughout the Middle East, not supporting them is the right thing to do. My point was I was talking about the right wing, the far right in Iran. I wasn't talking about the far right here in the United States. So to make that clear, I'm talking about the far right in Iran and that, that you're, because you say they support Trump, that's not the entirety of the Iranian people. It's just the Iranian far right. And I maybe I did compare that to the far right here in Israel and America. But my point is that the Iranian far right is on the same page with you. Um, as far as that, they must be willing to prove no country has allowed this kind of, these, this kind of, these, this, level of inspections before and there is a country in the middle east that that uh has nuclear weapons and doesn't admit it and doesn't allow any inspections but they complain about this all the time so let me let me ask you this what happens if we do nothing what happens if we uh we are doing something okay first of all you say no country has has ever allowed it that's wrong okay uh south africa had nuclear weapons they decided that they would open up over it. They turned over. I think they had six or eight nuclear bombs that were turned over. They allowed their sites to be inspected. They totally denuclearized. That's the sort of stuff that Trump is proposing for North Korea. OK, Libya did the same thing. Unfortunately, the idiot Obama then proceeded to for the flimsiest of re reasons, take out Muammar Gaddafi, who at that time was now cooperating and was a far better person to have in place than the terrorists that managed to that uh, Hillary and Obama supported. So to say that there's no regime that has never done this, you're wrong. It's happened twice. OK, it would be easy for Iran to just say, well, we don't need nuclear weapons. We'll open up everything. We'll prove that we don't have it. We don't need enrichment. If they really wanted to have nuclear power, they could buy enriched uranium, make it. They don't have to develop it. The only reason that they've got this development is so they can enrich uranium for nuclear bombs. OK, L allowing them to maintain any sort of enrichment 
uh, facilities is because they want the ability to create nuclear weapons. Yes, there's one country that probably has nuclear weapons, Israel. But that one country is the only democracy that has freedoms for everyone. Would you rather live as a Muslim in uh, Israel or as a Muslim who's, a, say, let's say, a Sunni in uh, Iran? A Sunni Muslim living in Israel has far more rights than a Sunni Muslim in Iran. And don't again say that it's the right wing Iranians that are supporting. It's all sorts of people that believe in freedom and do not like to be controlled by an oppressive, evil regime. Are you saying that anybody who says these, this regime is they're starving us, they won't they steal money that won't go for improving the roads and schools, but it goes for supporting terrorism and building their war machine and their nuclear bombs, people opposed to that? are somehow now right wing. It's every, all sorts of normal people who say, we love peace, we want freedoms, we don't want a, a, a Sharia type uh, enforcement. Those are right wing, wrong. I think you're misreading my argument if it's right, a right wing or left wing thing. That's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing to partisan politics when I say that. Because I, when I talk about economics and sanctions, that actually, this economic argument is a capitalist argument. So it is a right wing argument that I'm using. Um, so, the, so as you say, South Africa had nukes. They, yeah, they got them from Israel is why they're under apartheid. I don't, that's, uh, I don't know the full story there, but you go ahead and point to Gaddafi in North, North Korea. I, I think that you kind of answer, answer the, this goes back to my side, you kind of answer your own question here, because what happened when Gaddafi gave up his entire nuclear program as you just said they over obama and hillary came in and overthrew him and then what happens with north korea we're trying to bargain with north korea now now they might not think that we're as credible my moral argument that makes us the, the united states less credible because we just backed out of a deal for for no reason we, we pointed to something that happened before without the 2003 as if it happened now we didn't have any evidence that no new evidence was presented everyone already knew that that both the united states and uh, Israeli intelligence agency both said that both already knew that everyone that, that had already been in the news for years. So it wasn't it wasn't new news. And I, I think I'm just about yeah, I'm just about out of time. So, so let me go ahead. So so I think in this and this debate, I have very, very clearly illustrated that this is a wrong turn because of the economic impact, because it raises oil prices. It puts an economic burden on the EU, and the result of that will be that they will try to renegotiate without us. It will put us in a, in a position where we have to enforce sanctions on those countries, and they will try to come back at, through the World Trade Organization against us. And as we already saw with Cuba, that that hasn't because we tried to put sanctions on Cuba, it didn't. It, it's not going to work. So it's 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 putting playing partisan politics, and it's putting the U.S. and and a bad positioned economically and as far as as far as war goes i haven't heard when i ask you what if, what happens if we do nothing i didn't hear what would happen i just i i heard heard about i heard, i heard we, I, we heard about south africa and north korea and libya and as i and as and i i just answered that so the, this proxy situation is heating up in syria it's between iran and israel and uh where one side funds one terrorist and the other side funds the other terrorist and it's it's getting ugly, and that's that's a bigger threat for our ally, <laughs> our allies over there than uh, Iran is. So I think having for to to support economic stability, so, to and uh, and peace, vote pro for the resolution. And I thank my opponent for his time, and I thank you for watching. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing. Like I said, economics does not necessarily justify stupid policies. Just because you make more money doesn't mean you should deal with the terrorist. Okay. Libya had been defanged. Libya was safe. It was the idiot Obama, Obama who then took a good situation and made it bad. Okay. The fact that Libya did denuke was proof that it can be done. The fact that idiot idiot Obama then effed it up royal is 
a stain on his legacy like so many other of his horrible failures. Okay, we do not necessarily need to have economic trade with an evil regime that oppresses its own people. Sometimes a slight economic disruption is worth it in order to put pressure on them to force them to comply with international standards. And a lot of Europeans have sold out. Thanks again, support call out. Let's keep this going. It's been a lot of fun.